A pizza delivery man steps into a bank, not with an order, but with a shotgun in hand and a ticking bomb strapped to his chest, demanding a jaw-dropping $250,000. What unfolds next is beyond anyone's wildest imagination propelling this incident into the annals of America's most enigmatic and audacious bank heists. This day marked the beginning of a case that federal agents have described as one of the most complex tragedies and shocking crimes ever to grace the files of the FBI. Who is this man, and how did he end up with a bomb strapped to his chest? Join us as we delve into the heart of one of the strangest robberies in American history. On a day that began like any other, August 28, 2003, in the quiet town of Erie, Pennsylvania, Brian Wells, a 46-year-old pizza delivery man, was smoothly navigating through his routine shift at Mamma Mia's Pizzeria. However, at 1.30 p.m., the day's monotony was abruptly shattered by a perplexing phone call that cut through the usual kitchen hum. The caller's request, muddled and unclear, prompted the pizzeria's owner, baffled by the garbled message, to hand the phone to Brian. The request was simple yet unusual delivery, two sausage pizzas to 8631 Peach Street, an address that, unbeknownst to Brian, was an abandoned radio station. Subsequent investigation revealed that the call had originated from a payphone at a nearby gas station. Brian, oblivious to the oddity of the situation, proceeded with the delivery as instructed. But concerns escalated when he failed to return to work after an hour, deviating from his usual reliability. The plot thickened around 2.30 p.m. when Brian, departing significantly from any semblance of his routine pizza delivery duties, entered a local PNC bank. The scene was startling. Brian, a familiar face to many, was holding a cane and wearing a t-shirt boldly labeled, Guess. However, Beneath this seemingly innocuous attire lay a terrifying reality. A bomb collar was menacingly strapped to his chest, hidden under his shirt, and the cane in his hand was no ordinary cane, but a concealed shotgun. Approaching the teller, Brian presented a note demanding $250,000, revealing the dual threat of the disguised shotgun and the bomb collar. In the brief interval between the pizza delivery and his appearance at the bank, Brian had become unwittingly enmeshed in a dangerous plot, marked by the explosives fastened to his chest and a sinister device encircling his neck. Confronted with the impossibility of accessing the vault, the teller could only surrender $8,702, the only amount available in the register. Brian's exit from the bank with the cash set off an immediate evacuation of the premises and a rapid police response, marking the beginning of a baffling and intriguing case. This incident transformed an ordinary pizza delivery man into the central figure of one of the most mysterious robberies in American history. Brian Wells hastily drove away from the scene, aiming for the McDonald's parking lot. But about 15 minutes after the daring bank heist, Brian's escape took a dramatic turn when the police intercepted him as he attempted to leave McDonald's parking. The officers quickly pulled Brian from his vehicle and detained him, but amidst the chaos, he uttered a word that would escalate the situation to an unprecedented level. There is a bomb. A swift inspection under his shirt confirmed their worst fears. A bomb collar was indeed strapped menacingly around his neck. Without hesitation, the police evacuated the street initiating a wide perimeter around the area to ensure the safety of everyone nearby, and the bomb squad was urgently called to the scene. However, there was a significant obstacle to the bomb squad's arrival. To ensure no one was harmed in the event of an explosion, police began evacuating and securing the main road leading to the parking lot, resulting in severe traffic congestion on every distant street. As the police pointed their guns at Brian, Uncertainty clouded their judgment. They were torn between the possibilities. Had Brian strapped the bomb to himself for a bank robbery, or was he an unwilling participant in this sinister plot? They began to question him, seeking clarity. Brian claimed that three black men had captured him and affixed the bomb collar to his neck. When the officers pressed for more details about these men, Brian could only reiterate that they were three black men, offering no further identification. 
But the weird thing was that even amidst this high-stress interrogation, Brian made some bizarre requests, such as asking the police to call his boss to ensure he wouldn't be considered shirking his duties. He also suggested that if the police could follow certain steps, they might find the key to unlock the bomb collar around his neck. The police were perplexed by Brian's statements, but he insisted that following these steps from the notes could be their only chance at defusing the situation. A few minutes later, the bomb collar around Brian's neck began to emit beeping sounds, sending a wave of panic through everyone present. Brian's growing anxiety was palpable, mirroring the collective tension of the bystanders and officers. Brian started to scream as he pleaded with the officers to remove the bomb, screaming that he was not lying and that it would explode. As the beeping sound accelerated, Brian attempted to crawl away from the bomb strapped to his chest, as if trying to escape the imminent explosion. The tension continued to rise until, at precisely 3.18 p.m., the bomb detonated. The device affixed in front of Brian's chest had a metal plate intentionally cut into small pieces to create shrapnel. However, the plate did not function as intended to project outward. Instead, it forced a piece of metal inward, creating a hole in Brian's chest. News cameras captured the entire incident, and Brian passed away within seconds. Three minutes following the tragic explosion that claimed Brian's life, the bomb squad arrived at the scene. As they meticulously combed through his car and gathered evidence, they unearthed nine pages of handwritten notes. These notes laid out a sinister and elaborate scavenger hunt, not just for Brian, but also detailed instructions for the receptionist at the bank, the bank manager, and the police, labeling Brian as the bomb hostage. The instructions directed at Brian were chilling in their precision and complexity. The first page outlined a set of rules he was compelled to follow to disarm the bomb strapped to his chest. The rules were as follows. Number one, you must follow a course of instructions to find keys and combination codes to disarm the bomb do not insert keys into keyholes until instructed. Some keyholes are booby-trapped to prevent tampering. Number two, drive 60 miles an hour throughout the course. Number three, use only two or three minutes at each stop. A sentry will be watching at each stop to ensure you are not being followed. Number four, the bomb has trip wires. Forcing or tampering will detonate. Number five, all weapons, papers, containers, tapes, etc. must be returned to us. Each item you find after dropping money has a key and or combination word. You will need to decipher the combination. This will disarm some tripwires before you unlock them. This procedure is to make sure you leave no materials behind. This intricate set of instructions thrust Brian into a life or death hunt where he was forced to navigate through Erie in a desperate race against time seeking out various combinations and keys to prevent the bomb strapped to his chest from detonating. The meticulous planning and cruel nature of the notes painted a harrowing picture of the ordeal Brian was subjected to, turning his final moments into a twisted game orchestrated by unseen and malevolent forces. The police embarked on a meticulous investigation to piece together the events leading up to his untimely death. Their first course of action was to trace the steps outlined in the scavenger hunt, which seemed to dictate Brian's movements post-bank robbery meticulously. The trail led them to a McDonald's near the bank, the location Brian had visited immediately after the heist. Hidden discreetly next to the iconic McDonald's sign, under an inconspicuous rock, lay a jar. This jar, as the police discovered, contained crucial instructions for Brian's next steps in this elaborate and deadly game. It was at this point, as Brian was exiting the McDonald's premises, that the police had initially intercepted him, unaware that he was en route to fulfill another objective in this harrowing scavenger hunt. Brian's subsequent objective was intriguingly located in the dense woods just outside the town. According to the instructions, Brian's immediate task after departing McDonald's was to tie an orange ribbon around a fire hydrant. This act was to serve as a coded signal indicating the successful execution of the bank robbery. It appeared that the police had intervened at a critical juncture, precisely as Brian was about to perform this signaling task. 
Following the breadcrumb trail of notes, the police ventured into the specified woodland area. Their search efforts were rewarded when they discovered the telltale orange ribbon, along with another jar containing further instructions. This discovery underscored the chilling level of detail and planning involved in orchestrating this sinister quest. Amidst their investigation in the woods, Officer Lumont King reported a suspicious occurrence. A blue van emerged from the shadows of the tree line, pausing momentarily as if to survey the police activity around the area where the jar was found. Upon noticing the law enforcement presence, the van abruptly ceased its approach, reversed, and hastily retreated into the distance. This fleeting encounter suggested that the orchestrators of this twisted game were still monitoring the situation, adding another layer of urgency and danger to the investigation. In the heart of the woods, the police stumbled upon a cryptic note directing them to a distant road sign. The instructions were clear. Leave the car at the sign and trek through the tall grass into an awaiting field. Upon reaching their destination, the officers were met with an unexpected twist. A new jar, presumed to contain the next clue, was eerily empty. This turn of events hinted at two possibilities. Either the orchestrators, possibly the sentries or the individual in the blue van noted earlier, had observed the police's interference and preemptively removed the subsequent instructions, or perhaps Brian was never destined to reach this phase of the chase. Confronted with a sudden halt in the breadcrumb trail, the police were compelled to shift gears and initiate a conventional investigation. Under immense pressure to crack the case wide open, the police launched into action with urgency. Their initial step led them to Brian's home, where the search yielded scant evidence. Among the few items found, one stood out. The contact details of Jessica Hoopsick, a local woman known for her involvement in the sex trade. This discovery hinted at Brian's occasional forays into illicit activities, yet this was a far leap from implicating him in a bank robbery involving a bomb collar. The investigation then delved deeper into Brian's past, searching for connections or any hint that he might have been involved in or capable of orchestrating such a heinous act. Amidst this probing, a startling development occurred. Just three days after the robbery and Brian's tragic death, Robert Panetti, Brian's colleague at Mamma Mia's Pizzeria and the only other pizza delivery driver, was found dead in his home from what seemed to be a drug overdose. Given Robert's known history with substance abuse, his death by overdose wasn't entirely unexpected, yet it raised eyebrows among the investigators. Initially, the police had planned to interview Robert as part of their investigation. Brian had died on a Thursday, and by Saturday, they sought to question Robert. However, citing work commitments, Robert requested to postpone the interview to Monday. Tragically, he never made it to the interview, overdosing the night before. This sequence of events left investigators pondering the possibility of a deeper connection between Robert and the case at hand. Could the impending police interrogation, possibly related to the bank heist, have driven him to increase his drug use fatally? The circumstances of his death added layers of complexity to the investigation, leaving more questions than answers and suggesting that the case was far from being straightforward. As the investigation into the Erie bank robbery and Brian's tragic demise unfolded, the Erie police intensified their search for Jessica Hoopsick, but she seemed to have vanished without a trace. Amidst the widening search, another intriguing lead emerged. Jessica, a woman who had once been romantically involved with Brian, was now in a relationship with a man whose profession was the subject of varying reports. Some identified him as a welder, while others claimed he was a mechanic. Regardless of his exact occupation, there was consensus on his proficiency with tools, a skill set that lent itself to the potential creation of the sophisticated collar bomb. This lead gained traction, especially considering Brian's last statement before his untimely death. He claimed that three black men had forcibly placed the collar around his neck. This led the airy police to pursue individuals matching this description though such a broad and nondescript lead predictably yielded little progress. In their quest for answers, the police also focused on two significant locations, the abandoned radio tower and the bomb itself. 
The area surrounding the radio tower became a focal point for forensic analysis. Investigators meticulously examined the dirt road and paths leading to the tower, piecing together the events that transpired. The disturbed earth told a silent story of Brian's car arriving at the scene, where several individuals were in front of the tower. The markings on the ground suggested a brief, chaotic struggle, a scuffle that seemed to involve several people tumbling to the ground before Brian's car sped away. This forensic evidence at the radio tower offered a tangible connection to the mysterious events leading up to the robbery, providing investigators with crucial insights into the moments before the crime escalated. As the police delved deeper into these leads, the complexity of the case continued to unfold, painting a picture of a meticulously planned heist that left more questions than answers in its wake. The mystery deepened around the events at 8631 Peach Street, believed to be the critical location where Brian was forcibly fitted with the explosive collar. The focus then shifted to the bomb itself, an enigma that despite its apparent simplicity, baffled investigators. Constructed from two pipe bombs, filled with smokeless powder, and positioned against Brian's chest, the device's design was alarmingly basic yet lethal. Its locking mechanism resembled a large handcuff, employing a system of ratchets that snapped into place, with a key required to release the mechanism. However, the bomb's simplicity belied its complexity. It featured four keyholes and a three-digit combination lock. Further examination revealed additional perplexing elements. Inside the bomb's casing, two kitchen timers were discovered, set to initiate the countdown to detonation, marked by a beeping sound. Yet, the device also included baffling components intended to mislead or confuse, such as a non-functional cell phone and numerous wires leading nowhere, intentionally complicating the task for any police officer daring to remove it. Warnings inscribed on the collar itself introduced a sinister psychological element, cautioning against cutting the wrong wire under threat of immediate explosion. These details painted a picture of a device designed not just to kill, but to perplex and intimidate, adding layers of intrigue and horror to an already complex case. However, in an unprecedented and controversial move, the investigative team opted to remove Brian's head during the autopsy to preserve the bomb collar for further examination. This decision, while met with significant pushback from Brian's family, underscored the critical importance of the collar in unraveling the case's intricacies. At this point, the FBI started to put together a psychological profile, implying to the general public that the person responsible for this heinous act had goals beyond simple monetary gain. Stealing a quarter of a million dollars could be achieved through less convoluted means. The elaborate setup, selecting a victim, fitting him with a bomb collar, and sending him on a scavenger hunt laden with false clues and complex instructions, pointed to a perpetrator reveling in the orchestration of chaos and control. Just when it seemed the case couldn't become more bewildering, a new development emerged. On September 20th, Three weeks after Brian's tragic demise, a phone call to the Erie police introduced a chilling twist. The caller, a man named Bill Rothstein, claimed to have a dead body in his freezer. This startling revelation promised to unravel the case further, plunging investigators into a deeper web of mystery and malice. Bill Rothstein's shocking revelation to the Erie police introduced a new sinister twist to the already complex case. He claimed the body in his freezer was that of James Roden and pointed the finger at Marjorie Dill Armstrong as the perpetrator. Marjorie's name wasn't new to the local law enforcement or to the Erie community. Her history was as tumultuous as it was tragic, making her a figure of significant interest in the investigation. Marjorie's past was marked by legal and personal turmoil. In 1984, she became the center of Erie's most notorious murder case to that date after she shot her boyfriend six times in the chest while he slept. The case garnered widespread attention, partly due to Marjorie's defense that she acted out of self-preservation, claiming she had been subjected to abuse by the victim. Her assertion that she saw her only chance for safety in his vulnerability during sleep led to a highly publicized and contentious trial, resulting in her release. 
But Marjorie's interactions with the legal system didn't end there. Eight years later, in 1992, she was back in the spotlight under tragic circumstances when her husband suffered a fatal brain hemorrhage, allegedly after hitting his head on a coffee table. Marjorie's subsequent lawsuit against the hospital for malpractice and her victory in court raised eyebrows, especially against the backdrop of her violent history. This incident, coupled with the earlier shooting and the mysterious death of a former boyfriend, painted a grim picture of Marjorie's relationships with men, suggesting a pattern of death and suspicion that followed her. Back to our story, Bill Rothstein's call to the police revealed a chilling connection. He reported that Marjorie Deal Armstrong had murdered James Roden over a financial disagreement, and in a grim turn of events, Roden's body was hidden in Rothstein's freezer. Bill, admitting his fear of Marjorie's manipulative prowess, confessed to aiding in the disposal of the gun and storing the body to cover up the crime. However, Marjorie's subsequent request to dismember Roden's body was a step too far for Bill, prompting him to contact authorities. The link between this macabre tale and the Brian Wells case became apparent when the location of Rothstein's residence was disclosed. 8645 Peach Street, essentially the vicinity of the abandoned radio tower, the site of the bank heist's inception. Following Bill's instructions, the police apprehended Marjorie, uncovering a scene of chaos within both their homes. The pair were revealed to be compulsive hoarders, their living spaces so cluttered that navigating the rooms was a challenge, with the floor barely visible beneath the debris. The search unveiled not only the clutter but also bizarre collections, including hundreds of pounds of butter and cheese, all spoiled and rotting. The arresting officers recalled the overpowering odors of decay and neglect that permeated the house, marked by the presence of dog feces and decomposing food. Marjorie, in particular, was remembered for her vociferous demeanor and the foul stench that clung to her, painting a vivid picture of the squalid conditions. Marjorie was very tough to deal with. She talked a lot and often got angry, making things hard for everyone, even people trying to help her like reporters and her lawyer. Some doctors thought she had bipolar disorder, which means her mood changes a lot but others thought she just had narcissistic personality. FBI agents who had to talk to her after the investigation found it very hard. Marjorie would get very angry at them, saying mean things and showing she didn't like them at all. But if someone said something nice about how she looked, she would suddenly stop being angry. This showed how unpredictable she was. Dealing with Marjorie was complicated. She could go from very angry to calm quickly, making it a challenge for those working on the case. When Bill Rothstein called the police to report a dead body in his freezer, claiming Marjorie was the only one responsible, the police were quick to act. They were already familiar with Marjorie's troubled past, so they immediately went to arrest her and recover Roden's body from Bill's house. Shortly after making this call to the police, it seemed that Bill reportedly tried to end his own life before the police came to the scene and he left a note but somehow he didn't actually attempt anything. Anyway, Bill's note, left in the assumption that he would not be alive when the police arrived, expressed remorse and identified the body in the freezer as James Roden, insisting he played no part in his death. The note intriguingly begins with a declaration that the situation has nothing to do with the Wells case, a statement that only deepened the mystery for investigators. Imagine being an investigator receiving a call about a body located essentially at the epicenter of the bomb collar bank robbery investigation, the abandoned radio tower. And indeed, the autopsy revealed that James Roden died three weeks before Brian Wells. The proximity of these events raised questions. Bill's note explicitly advising against linking his case with Brian Wells has added another layer of intrigue especially when he later claimed ignorance about any connection. At this juncture, the FBI faced a perplexing scenario. Three deaths with no apparent link, except for Rothstein's cryptic message urging them not to probe into a possible connection. It's not hard to imagine the frustration and curiosity swirling among the investigators. It seemed that while they had been diligently working on the Wells case, other significant events were unfolding in the background hidden from their view. 
Now, the investigation's focus shifts to Bill Rothstein and Marjorie Armstrong as the primary leads. Let's delve into who Bill Rothstein was. Unlike Marjorie, Bill was difficult to deal with for another reason. He was the type of person who believed he was the smartest in any room. Bill often used complex words unnecessarily and looked down on those he considered less educated. In interviews, he was known to suddenly start speaking French or Hebrew, then sarcastically remark that he would switch to English for those who couldn't keep up. Bill was also very skilled technically. He knew a lot about machinery and metalwork and was recognized for his talents. Despite his abilities, he never stuck with one path for long. He considered becoming a pilot and a professor but lost interest in each. This indecision led him to live in a poorly kept house, all while claiming intellectual superiority because of his language skills. Bill and Marjorie had a romantic history. They were even engaged at one point. However, their relationship ended badly. Despite this, Bill remained devoted to Marjorie, always ready to help her whenever she needed, according to their acquaintances. It's important to note that both Bill and Marjorie were not just smart in a conventional sense, they were also cunning. Marjorie held a master's degree, and Bill was well-educated, having taken various college courses. He even led a group he dubbed the Fractured Intellectuals, a name that suggests they saw themselves as superior thinkers, separate from the rest. This group, as Bill named it, likely consisted of individuals who shared his belief in their own intellectual superiority, echoing his disdain for the common intellect. It turns out, that part of the reason the investigation faced challenges was that the investigators might have underestimated Bill Rothstein and Marjorie. When Bill was brought in for questioning about the phone call that led to Marjorie's arrest and the discovery of James Roden's body, he didn't hold back any details. He shared that Marjorie had been at odds with James for a long time. Their relationship was tumultuous, swinging from intense affection to extreme anger swiftly. Bill recounted the specific incident where, after a heated argument about money, Marjorie shot James in the back with a shotgun. Bill then helped her by placing James's body in his freezer and destroying the shotgun with a torch, all for $2,000. Bill was willing to go to great lengths for Marjorie, but he drew the line at dismembering James's body, which led him to contact the police. Interestingly, James Roden's murder occurred three weeks before Brian Wells's tragic death, suggesting no direct connection between the two incidents aside from the coincidental proximity of the body to the radio station. During the investigation, the police managed to involve Floyd Stockton, a former roommate of Bill Rothstein's, who was hiding due to allegations of inappropriate conduct with a minor. Despite his questionable character, Floyd confirmed Bill's account regarding James Roden, but denied having any knowledge about the Brian Wells case. This added another layer to the investigation, intertwining multiple complex characters and stories, yet leaving the connection to Brian Wells murky. Pause for a moment and picture this. There's a woman with a track record of murder. She's been acquitted before, but it's clear she has ended the lives of at least two people, Roden and her first boyfriend, whether those actions were deemed justifiable or not. This woman, Entangled in a complex relationship with a man whose home fronts the very location Brian Wells was abducted, a man fascinated with crafting intricate metal devices and obsessed with demonstrating his intelligence. Now, imagine trying to solve a puzzle, who at that deserted radio station could orchestrate a situation where a man ends up with a bomb around his neck, forced into a deadly scavenger hunt. Yet, what unfolds next? After consulting with Stockton, the FBI decides to exclude Rothstein from the investigation of Brian Wells's case, focusing instead on his involvement with James Roden. Despite the glaring proximity of Rothstein's residence to the scene of Wells's abduction and his explicit note distancing himself from the Wells case, the FBI sees no reason to link him to it. When Bill Rothstein was cleared by the police from any involvement in the Brian Wells case, Marjorie was far from pleased. Despite any hints of a complex relationship between them, it was clear they did not get along in public. Their interactions were filled with bitterness, 
each seemingly eager to see the other get in trouble with the law. While moving through the jail with cameras following her, Marjorie shouted out loud that Bill Rothstein was the one behind Brian Wells' death. This accusation turned the spotlight back onto Rothstein, raising suspicions once again, even though the FBI had previously moved on from considering him a suspect. But throughout this period, Rothstein consistently denied any connection to the case. Alongside these challenges, Rothstein was battling a severe illness, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which gradually worsened his health, leading him to be hospitalized in 2004. In the final days of July, with Rothstein facing the end of his life, FBI agents made one last effort to extract any possible confession or information related to the Wells case. They reminded him of his imminent death, suggesting he had nothing to lose by confessing. Despite their persistence, Rothstein's response was to simply trace a no in the air with his finger, without even looking at the agents. Bill Rothstein passed away on July 30, 2004, maintaining his innocence in relation to the Brian Wells case until his final moments. His unwavering denial, contrasted against Marjorie's public accusations, left a lasting mystery and many unanswered questions about his possible involvement in a case that had captivated and confounded the public. This detail about the kitchen timers was crucial because it was something only those involved in the case would know. Marjorie also brought up something odd about Rothstein. He had a blue van that he started using again only after he was cleared of any involvement in Brian Wells's case. Interestingly, as mentioned earlier, a blue van was spotted by Lament King in the woods on the day of the bank robbery, suggesting it could have been Rothstein's van. Additionally, during the investigation, authorities discovered a letter from Marjorie expressing her anger towards PNC Bank, the same bank Wells robbed. She mistakenly believed the bank allowed her father to access her savings account, though it turned out the money was rightfully his. This detail added another layer to Marjorie's potential motives and connections to the case. As the FBI gently probed her about her grievances with the bank, Marjorie began to divulge more information. She implicated Rothstein and Floyd Stockton, Rothstein's former roommate, suggesting a deeper involvement in the planning and execution of the heist. Meantime, the case continued to capture public interest featuring on news outlets and shows like America's Most Wanted multiple times. Each retelling in the media brought new details to light, such as the origin of the phone call that ordered the pizzas leading to Wells's involvement, made from a payphone at a local gas station. This blend of new revelations from Marjorie, the intriguing detail about the blue van, and the ongoing media coverage kept the case in the public eye unraveling new threads in the complex tapestry of the Brian Wells heist. Soon after Bill Rothstein's passing, it seemed Marjorie Deal Armstrong realized her options were narrowing. With the evidence piling up against her, she admitted to being involved in James Roden's death. She pleaded guilty to third-degree murder while claiming she was mentally ill, leading to her being sentenced to 20 years in a mental health facility. With Rothstein no longer in the picture, Marjorie quickly started pointing fingers, claiming Rothstein was the mastermind behind Brian Wells's tragic end. Her sentencing for Roden's murder became a platform for her to divulge more about the Wells case, a topic she initially avoided. Marjorie's desire to be moved to a different facility became evident through her frequent calls to her attorney and the media, sometimes up to twice an hour, eagerly discussing the case. Her lawyer suggested that Marjorie offer information about the Wells case in exchange for a transfer to another facility. However, in her discussions, Marjorie revealed significant details, including Rothstein's request for her to purchase two kitchen timers for use in the bomb. This piece of information was crucial, as the existence of two timers in the explosive device had not been disclosed to the public. The breakthrough came when a man from Erie, who was watching America's Most Wanted, recognized Bill Rothstein and Marjorie Deal Armstrong from the show. He remembered seeing them at the payphone on the morning of August 28th, the same payphone used to place the call that led Brian Wells to the radio tower. This was a significant moment. Now there was an eyewitness linking Rothstein and Marjorie directly to the start of the heist. Furthermore, 
Another witness reported a peculiar sighting on August 28th. He recalled seeing Marjorie driving erratically on the wrong side of the highway at high speed. Her distinctive appearance struck him, and he recognized her when he later saw her on TV. This placed Marjorie near the scene on the day of the heist, adding more weight to her involvement. When the FBI approached Marjorie with these eyewitness accounts, they knew it wasn't enough to charge someone based on a single witness's statement. Confronted with the evidence, Marjorie's response was cunning. She offered to spill everything she knew in exchange for immunity. Her confidence was evident. She was convinced she held valuable information. Marjorie's penchant for talking about herself and her involvement became her downfall as she began to reveal more than she probably intended. The investigators proposed a ride along with Marjorie to trace her movements on the day of the heist. This was an opportunity to hear directly from Marjorie about the events of August 28th, who appeared unable to stop telling her story due to a combination of self-importance and a desire to take advantage of the situation. Marjorie Deal Armstrong agreed to a ride along with the FBI, taking them on a tour of her whereabouts on the day of the heist. Surprisingly, her stops were all very close to where Brian Wells was that day, near the bank, the McDonald's, and Eyeglass World. Marjorie suggested she was just out shopping, coincidentally near Brian at each location, claiming ignorance of the day's chaos, including the bank robbery and the bomb explosion, until she saw the news that evening. Back at the jail, after sharing her story, Marjorie suddenly clammed up, refusing to share more without a promise of immunity. This move showed a lack of understanding of how bargaining or immunity works, especially after revealing so much. Despite having a master's degree, Marjorie's desire to boast about her involvement compromised her intelligence. As a result of her own incriminating statements, the FBI was already building a case against her. In jail, waiting for her trial for James Roden's murder. Fellow inmates, including Kelly McKellar, started documenting Marjorie's boasts about the case. She even mentioned Floyd Stockton's involvement and chillingly referenced measuring Wells's neck for the bomb collar. These notes, however, were initially overlooked by the police, who filed them away in a desk labeled snitch notes and forgot about them. This oversight delayed the use of potentially crucial evidence in building the case. Ken Barnes, another figure tied to this tangled story, also came under FBI scrutiny. A local drug dealer acquainted with Stockton, Rothstein, and Marjorie. Barnes had socialized with Marjorie and Roden, even going fishing together. During the investigation into Roden's death, Barnes openly discussed the volatile relationship between Marjorie and Roden, expressing little surprise at the turn of events. Additionally, Marjorie tried to leverage information about Barnes to negotiate a better deal for herself, revealing the intricate web of relationships and secrets surrounding the case. And because in the world of crime, loyalty is often fleeting, in 2005, while Ken Barnes was in jail on unrelated drug charges, he let slip to his brother-in-law about his involvement in the Brian Wells case. The brother-in-law went to the police after learning this information and suggested that Barnes might be associated with the infamous bank heist. The police wasted no time in questioning Barnes, who began to drop hints about Marjorie Deal Armstrong's role in the plot. As news of Barnes's statements reached Marjorie, she quickly revised her narrative. She shifted blame away from Rothstein alone, implicating both Rothstein and Barnes as the brains behind the operation while painting herself as an innocent bystander. This back and forth of accusations continued, with Barnes sharing insights into Marjorie's involvement and Marjorie pointing the finger back at Barnes. Sensing that Marjorie might strike a plea deal that could leave him vulnerable, Barnes decided to act first. On December 9, 2005, he came clean with a full confession. Barnes revealed a shocking motive behind the bank heist, Marjorie wanted her father dead. After her mother's death, Marjorie watched as her once wealthy father began donating his fortune to the community and local churches. Fearing her inheritance was slipping away, Marjorie concocted a plan to accelerate her access to his wealth by eliminating him. An interesting twist to this tale is the father's perspective. 
When questioned, he mentioned that Marjorie was never part of his will, fully aware of her unstable nature and the potential threat she posed to his life. Despite her father's precautions, Marjorie was convinced that hastening his death would secure her financial future before he could give away what she believed was rightfully hers. So, she decided to ask Ken Barnes for a price quote on murdering her dad. Ken, seeing an opportunity, wondered if Marjorie would pay him up front, though he claimed he never intended to go through with it, and that it was just a joke from him. However, his involvement in planning suggests otherwise. Barnes set his price at $250,000, and together with Marjorie, Bill Rothstein, Floyd Stockton, and others, they began plotting a bank heist from which they hoped to remain detached. According to Barnes, the day before the heist, on August 27th, a meeting took place with Floyd Stockton, Bill Rothstein, Marjorie Deal Armstrong, Robert Panetti, and surprisingly, Brian Wells. Ken Barnes said that Brian was knowingly involved in the plot that would lead to his tragic end. This revelation stunned everyone, as it was hard to imagine Brian as a participant in his own demise. Initially, James Roden was supposed to be the getaway driver for the heist, but his absence in the weeks leading up to the event and his subsequent murder, possibly at the hands of Marjorie for fearing he might back out or expose the plan, tied the Roden case directly to the bank heist conspiracy. This intricate web of plans, betrayals, and tragic outcomes highlights the depth of deception and the lengths to which these individuals were willing to go to achieve their objectives. Eyewitness accounts and Floyd Stockton's later confession, following a plea deal, support the idea that Brian Wells was involved in the plot. Ken Barnes shared that Brian believed he would be wearing a fake bomb a tool to claim innocence should their plan fail. In this scenario, if police intercepted Brian and discovered the bomb was harmless, Brian could argue he was under the impression his life was in danger, distancing himself from the role of a criminal in the eyes of law enforcement. However, as Barnes describes, the plot took a sinister turn on August 28. Marjorie picked him up on the morning of the heist, and they all met at the radio tower. It was there, after Brian delivered the pizza, that he found himself surrounded by Ken, Floyd, Bill, and Marjorie. In a chilling moment, Stockton emerged with the bomb collar, and at that time, Brian knew that the bomb was a real one, signaling a grave departure from the plan he had agreed to. When the situation's reality set in, Brian made an attempt to flee, but Barnes and Stockton tackled him. Amidst the struggle, Rothstein fired a shot into the air, an action that matched local reports of a gunshot heard before the robbery and the evidence of a scuffle observed on the dirt road near the site. The group then forcibly attached the bomb collar to Brian, and then Marjorie put the t-shirt over him that was labeled with the word guess. As Marjorie placed the t-shirt over the bomb collar on Brian, she instructed him to mislead the police if questioned suggesting he blamed the deed on three unidentified black men. This manipulation explains Brian's final statement, attributing the crime to three black men as he struggled to make sense of his dire situation. During the heist, Marjorie and Ken Barnes monitored the events from afar, using binoculars to watch Brian navigate the challenges of the robbery, based on the locations Marjorie later claimed to have visited during the incident. When the situation escalated and the bomb detonated, Marjorie hastily fled, making a panicked and wrong turn onto the highway, as witnessed by a passerby. On March 27, 2007, Floyd Stockton also confessed, receiving immunity in exchange. His account aligned with Barnes's, although, at that time, confessions weren't typically recorded on video. The FBI opted for written notes, believing on-camera confessions might alter a person's willingness to speak freely. Despite the lack of video evidence, the FBI confirmed the consistency between Barnes's and Stockton's stories. While neither Stockton nor Barnes claimed to be the brains behind the operation, evidence pointed to Rothstein's significant role, especially in constructing the bomb collar. Investigators discovered diagrams and writings in Rothstein's home that closely matched the design of the explosive device, hinting at his craftsmanship and involvement. 
Despite Rothstein's apparent role in the physical creation of the bomb, Marjorie's influence loomed large, with her denials pitted against the accounts of her co-conspirators. The case became a complex puzzle of contrasting narratives. Marjorie Deal Armstrong faced trial for her role in the bank robbery, armed with a destructive device, among other charges, and was found guilty on all counts. Throughout the trial, she was disruptive, often shouting liar at witnesses, which led the judge to frequently demand silence from her. Ultimately, Marjorie received a life sentence plus an additional 30 years, specifically for armed bank robbery, conspiracy to commit armed bank robbery, and using a destructive device during a violent crime. Ken Barnes, due to his cooperation with the authorities and his testimony against Marjorie, saw his sentence for his role in the conspiracy reduced from 45 to 22 years as part of a plea deal. Floyd Stockton, on the other hand, was granted immunity for his testimony and walked free, despite his past offenses involving a minor. During her trial, Marjorie was diagnosed with breast cancer, with doctors estimating she had seven to 10 years left to live. Despite her prognosis, she continued to deny any involvement in the conspiracy, criticizing the FBI's decision-making and insisting on her innocence, as well as Brian Wells' participation in the plot. Marjorie maintained this stance until her death on April 4, 2017. Ken Barnes passed away on June 20, 2019, due to diabetes-related complications, and he was expected to be released in 2027. Floyd Stockton was not present to testify against Marjorie due to undergoing heart surgery at the time and later passed away on August 10, 2022, from acute respiratory failure. With the deaths of all key figures involved, the full truth behind the intricate plot and each person's exact role in the Brian Wells case has gone to the grave with them. This leaves a shroud of mystery and unanswered questions surrounding one of the most bizarre and tragic bank heist stories ever told. But the story doesn't end here. Among all the names mentioned, Jessica Hoopsick remains a critical figure yet to fully share her side of the story. Initially, she was just a phone number found in Brian Wells's house, leaving many to wonder about her role, if any, in this complex case. For 15 years, despite efforts by the FBI, local police, and Brian's family to reach her, Jessica remained elusive. When approached by police with questions about the Wells case, she claimed ignorance and, without any evidence to hold her, was free to go. Attempts by news crews and federal agents to contact her always ended with Jessica slipping away. Jessica's significance in the investigation was heightened by her mention by Ken Barnes, who was a local drug dealer who supplied many in Airy, including Jessica, with crack. This connection hinted at a deeper involvement or knowledge of the events leading to the heist, especially considering Barnes' own role in the conspiracy. The puzzle surrounding Jessica's relationship to Brian and the heist deepens with Ken Barnes' accounts, placing her in the intricate web of relationships that define this case. Despite the conviction of Marjorie Deal Armstrong and Bill Rothstein as key orchestrators of the crime, many details remain unresolved including the exact sequence of events leading up to Brian Wells' tragic end. Barnes's narrative suggests that Brian was actively involved in the heist planning, yet certain aspects of his story, like Brian waiting for payment for the pizzas at the radio tower, raise more questions than answers. Jessica Hoopsick's elusive nature and her tangential connections to key figures in the case leave a gap in the story that only she can fill. As the last living person with potential insights into the web of relationships and events that culminated in the heist, her account could shed light on lingering mysteries and perhaps offer closure to a case marked by tragedy and intrigue. According to Ken Barnes's account, Brian Wells approached the scene under the impression that the phone call for pizza delivery was just a way to excuse him from work, not realizing it was the setup for a bank heist. This scenario suggests Brian seemingly unaware of the true plot, expected to complete the pizza delivery, return to work, and then, bizarrely, participate in robbing a bank for a substantial sum. 
When questioned about this inconsistency, Barnes tried to clarify that Wells wasn't aware they were planning to rob the bank at that moment, pointing out that while Wells attended the meeting, he somehow remained oblivious to the heist's objective. Additionally, Barnes brought up Robert Panetti's presence at the meeting, adding another layer to the story. While not widely known, Floyd Stockton seemingly confirmed Panetti's involvement, yet, like a puzzle piece that doesn't quite fit, Panetti's role and presence at the crucial moments remain unclear, almost as if he vanished from the narrative without a trace. This recounting of events raises more questions than it answers, portraying Brian Wells in a conflicting light, both as a potential co-conspirator and as someone possibly missled about the heist nature. The inclusion of Robert Panetti in the discussions, followed by his mysterious absence from key parts of the narrative, only deepens the mystery surrounding the heist and those involved. Robert Panetti's involvement seems to be mentioned only in the context of ensuring Brian Wells could take the call that would lead him to the radio tower, and then, notably, he overdoses just days later. This sequence of events raises suspicions about the true nature of everyone's involvement and the narratives being presented. The suggestion that key figures in the investigation might have been tailoring their stories to fit the FBI's expectations cannot be ignored. The FBI's interest in Panetti and Wells, possibly influenced by their connections to known criminal activities, seems to have shaped the direction of questioning and the investigation. The acknowledgement of Panetti's presence at planning meetings, followed by his sudden absence, alongside Wells' alleged involvement without knowledge of the heist's true purpose, paints a picture of a narrative conveniently aligned with investigative leads. The granting of immunity, especially to individuals with significant criminal backgrounds, in exchange for information that corroborates certain aspects of the case, adds another layer of complexity and potential bias to the investigation. This strategy, while effective in building a case against certain individuals, raises questions about the reliability of the information being provided and the motivations behind it. Jessica Hoopsick's eventual decision to share her story after years of silence adds yet another perspective to the unfolding narrative. Her assertion that Ken Barnes approached her about a bank robbery establishes a direct connection between her and the larger conspiracy and raises the possibility of a wider network of involvement than was previously believed. Jessica Hoopsick's account adds a significant twist to the narrative, suggesting Ken Barnes and Floyd Stockton played a more crucial role in the bank heist than previously admitted. According to Jessica, Barnes was actively seeking a gaffer for the heist, someone compliant and easily manipulated. Jessica's relationship with Brian Wells went beyond mere acquaintanceship. They shared a kind of friendship, with Brian even helping her with errands and appointments. Addressing a sensitive point, it's been hinted that Brian might not have been the sharpest, described by those who knew him as incredibly kind and genuine, but perhaps not the most astute. He had a simple life, working diligently as a pizza delivery driver, and was known for his expressive nature. Brian could be easily influenced, a fact Jessica seemed to recognize. Jessica revealed that Barnes proposed using Brian for the heist, offering drugs as payment for finding a suitable person. She believed Brian's amiable and obliging personality made him an ideal candidate. After providing Barnes with Brian's work schedule to ensure the heist coincided with his delivery rounds, Jessica inadvertently played a part in setting the tragedy in motion. For over a decade, the prevailing belief was that Brian and Robert Panetti were involved in the conspiracy. However, Jessica's late confession paints them in a more innocent light, suggesting they were unwittingly ensnared in the plot. Despite her involvement in recruiting Brian, Jessica claimed ignorance of the lethal intent behind the robbery. Jessica's silence for 15 years raises questions about her motives for finally coming forward and the implications of her involvement. With the FBI considering the case closed and Brian labeled a co-conspirator, Jessica's belated admission introduces doubts about the established narrative and the true extent of each participant's role in the tragic events surrounding the bank heist. During the hearing seance, Brian Wells' family passionately defended him, vehemently denying the claims that he was involved in the heist, while Jessica Hoopsick remained quiet through the outcry. This silence, 
Paired with her later accusations against Marjorie and her insistence on Brian's innocence, casts a complex shadow on her credibility. Despite this, Jessica's motives for coming forward after such a long silence remain unclear, especially since she had already been dismissed as a suspect or participant in the crime, facing only unrelated drug charges. However, the doubts about Brian Wells' involvement in the bank heist were amplified by the FBI's conclusion that he was a conspirator, a decision that didn't sit well with many, given the inconsistencies in the narratives provided by those involved. Ken Barnes' accounts, which sometimes portrayed Wells as aware of the fake bomb, and at other times is completely oblivious until its activation, contributed to this confusion. The notion that it was simpler for the authorities if Wells was seen as complicit, thereby avoiding murder charges for the conspirators, raises questions about the investigation's conclusions. Jessica Hoopsick's revelation that she was the one who indirectly involved Brian by providing his information to Barnes introduces a tragic layer to this story. It suggests that Brian might have been an unwitting participant, manipulated into a situation far beyond his comprehension. There is also a possibility that Brian was coerced, perhaps under threat to himself or his family. This theory is supported by Marjorie's claim that they measured Brian's neck for the collar and reports of Brian's debt to Barnes. Through all these revelations, it appears Marjorie Deal Armstrong was the orchestrator, with Rothstein, Stockton, and Barnes as key players in executing her plan, leaving Brian Wells as the ultimate victim. This complex web of relationships and motives paints a picture of a heist that involved manipulation, coercion, and tragic outcomes. Yet, one lingering question remains. Why did Bill Rothstein call the police about James Roden's body if he and Marjorie were co-conspirators in a major crime? This action seems counterintuitive, risking their exposure for a crime far greater than hiding a body. This case, which captured the nation's attention in 2003, remains a bewildering puzzle of motives, allegiances, and secrets, with Brian Wells's tragic role at its heart. Despite the years and the closure of the FBI file, many aspects of this case remain unresolved, leaving room for speculation, theories, and a quest to understand the true extent of each individual's involvement. As we finish this mysterious case, it's clear there are still many unanswered questions. What do you think about this story? Do you have any ideas or guesses that might explain the unanswered parts? Feel free to share your thoughts and theories in the comments section below. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this story as interesting as I did. Don't forget to like and subscribe. See you next time.